You guys were at the same school together, weren't you? Mm. Ah. Just not the same time. And so you, were you at the same time as Wilkinson? Yeah, Johnny. Yeah, Johnny was at the school at the same time, same boarding house, Sutton House. What sort of house were you? <laughs> I was in Summerfield. Okay. Were you in Sutton? <laughs> I was in Sutton, yeah. So uh, we were literally at the ends of the school. Yeah, Summerfield yeah. is a bit cooler, though, just because... <laughs> it, it was when I arrived. <laughs> yeah. Who did you... You had Mr. Machen, is that right? Um, Mr. Machen, Mr. Booth. Mr. Booth. Mr. Booth. No, he... Emma Booth was our matron. Um, but Summerfield was a better house because you had Hazelveer next door. Yeah. You had the first team pitch just there, and you had Gosden House, which was the girls' house. This is Lord's Wandsworth, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and and but you weren't. It, it was a it was a boarding school, but you weren't allowed to mix with the girls at night, were you? We didn't really have many girls. So <laughs> from... there, was, there was, I think there was like five in my year. Yeah, it? <laughs> honestly, it was insane. So when I was there, it was um, it was all boys up until sixth form, so A levels, and yeah. then that's when it was mixed. So there was literally like five girls at school. But did you have a high school heartthrob? I had, yeah. I think I had two. I had none. No, I had two girlfriends when I was at Lord's Wandsworth. Well, at the same time, and, and neither, <laughs> of them were, neither of them were real. <laughs> they were best mates, though. <laughs> no, yeah, no, it, it was great. It was, um, yeah. I mean, but girlfriends at school like lasted like three. Well, mine did three weeks. <laughs> I didn't dispose of that. It was just our relationship. I had they lasted about three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I think I was a, a late bloomer at school. Right. You were not a late bloomer. Not 100%. You, well, when did you first kiss someone? 16. That was your first kiss? Yeah, I was. Uh, I went to a club in Guildford. Uh, MNG? <laughs> no, it was called The Drink. <laughs> Yeah. That's, next, that's next door, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The drink. The drink. Whoever what, owned yeah, that. What'd you, yeah, what'd you get up to there? Yeah, yeah. That's what it says on the tip. Whoever owned that went, it's obviously money laundering. What should we call it? The drink. The drink. Yeah. Well, how can we get the cops off us? How can we? we call it the drink. Perfect. Yeah, that makes sense. But they used, but they used to host what they would call nappy nights, where it's like underage. So you've gone to the drink for a nappy night. I was 16. I love what the world used to be like. It's yeah, just so it's absurd. So innocent. No. Where are you going? To the club. Why? For a drink. We'll call it the drink. They're underage. What should we call it? Nappy nights. Yeah, because that will boost their confidence. Did you wear a nappy? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't like some sordid club where everyone just turned up. Pretty that goes on in the box, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wait, so, so hang on. So you went to nappy nights and... What, Someone must have mistaken it and actually gone in a nappy, I reckon, at one point. And um, I remember they had this live set. There was a... <laughs> a, a, a live set at a nappy night at the drink. I can only in imagine Guildford, what a live in. set. <laughs> Whoa, settle in, lads. <laughs> uh, they had someone called Glamour Kid and Shola Amma. Um, doing a live set. Right. <laughs> this is how innocent it was. They were throwing out curly whirlies. <laughs> what the guy? What playing? just hitting people in the head? Oh fuck! <laughs> yeah. Throwing out curly whirlies. Throwing out curly whirlies, and this girl. <laughs> <laughs> this genuine story and I caught a curly whirly yeah of course he did standard and um, this girl walks over to me and went um, oh your curly whirly looks long and floppy <laughs> you looked down at went, your natty and you went <laughs> how can you say <laughs> Wait, hang on a second. I swear she I said swear, that to you that's exactly what she said and I just thought I was the man so I, I love you <laughs> yeah I was like should we get married <laughs> Is this what love is? If it is, this is what I want. Wait, so she said that to you. Your curly whirly is, looks long and floppy. Yeah, like literally the same length as every other curly whirly that has been chucked about. Okay. <laughs> Whilst people getting high on Pepsi and <laughs> lemonade. Panda pop. Yeah, like, and panda pop. Do you remember panda pops? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Little stubby bottles. Yeah, yeah. I used to buy them from the youth club. You get really jacked up. <laughs> So wait, so hang on. So you did that. You did that, and then, um, and then you kissed her. No, she um, she took me onto the dance floor away yeah. from my friends, and I did a thing which is still really cringy today. I was so chuffed of myself that there was a girl that fancied me. Mm. As she was leading me away, I like looked over my shoulder to the lads to be like, 
look at me. Never done this before, by the way. Never kissed a girl. But look at me. First time. <laughs> so, so, so in the in-between. <laughs> so, yeah. Also, the internal dialogue that's going on in your head. You're going, I'm going to look at them and they're going to look back at me. And then I'm going to be saying to them, I'm the man. But yeah. they're not gonna, I'm not going to say that to them. They're just going to know I'm going to be saying that. And it's not like this is the first time we've um, ever been out when I say been out, to a nappy night. And they'd never seen me walk off with a girl before in my life. So anyway, I walked off and this girl like kissed me. Mm. And she kissed me because I didn't know what I was doing. But like, I'm not sure what I did in those moments. I definitely know I closed my eyes out of sheer embarrassment and awkwardness. I, I couldn't look her in the face. And I was just so, I was just awkward. I was embarrassed. I genuinely don't know. There was a little bit of tongue and I was like, what do we do? I've seen this on movies. Where do I put it? Do we just like go round and round and round? At what point do we stop? How do I breathe and kiss at the same that time? Sounds quite traumatic. Genuinely. <laughs> Did you have I moments breathe? of doubt where you're like, she's only in this for my curly right? Yeah. <laughs> she just wants it. If you want it, take yeah. it. I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. Because so you said to her, if you want it, take it. Yeah. Be done with it. Because it should be an experience, but it's an experience which posed so many more questions than I ever thought. Because on TV, it was just, they just looked like having a good time. The mental trauma I was going I know, through was just like, what's going on? And then you always finish. And it wasn't enjoyable. And then you finish it and you almost want um, feedback. Was that right? Yeah. <laughs> was that right? Well, we kind of, it was so transactional. So we kissed, well, I oh, kissed, I don't know. Was it just like a tongue assault? I genuinely, I have not a clue. I walked back and it was obvious I'd kissed this girl. This girl's white. I'm black. Shock. There we are. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> thank, thank God you got that. Oh my God. Thank I God you really, got that out of the <laughs> Jesus. I, I didn't know how to approach that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God. I like, walk back. Shock. <laughs> Mic drop. There we go. I always, like, Is that your you, chat on the night as well? <laughs> you paused at that moment. She was white. I'm black. Yes. Yeah. Why did you pause? <laughs> The, the, the point I'm trying to get to is we just stood <laughs> awkwardly at you. <laughs> and I like walked back to lads and they knew I'd kissed her, not because I had a swagger who I was skipping across and I looked really happy. It's because I had all her foundation <laughs> over my face. Oh my God. It's horrible. All of her makeup. It's like some, some crime scene. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Look, that's, look at me, boys. Yes, that's why I said, like, like, I, if I was to wear makeup, I wouldn't apply that tone of makeup on my face. But it was splattered across my face. This is what it looks like to be a player. I was like, none of this is cool. Like, none of this is cool. <laughs> so that was it. Like, it was not a great first experience. How, how have things gone from there? Is that still... Um, I don't know. I'd say the beard's more an issue now because you can get um, you can get skin irritation, can't you? Not Wait, me. so but surely you must have been you must be so developed when you're younger. You must have been one of these kids that were just big. I, I I wasn't like the biggest lad at school. I was really quick at school, and then in my first year at Harlequins, it was the best and worst thing that happened to me because my mum was like, "Go to uni, like African household." I was like, "Mum, I think I'm going to take a year out to play rugby." She was like, "What's rugby?" Like, what you're are you like, on about? Have you not been watching what I've been doing on my weekends? For like, yeah. Like, she's like, what are you on about? Like, that's a hobby. What are you on about? Get that foundation off your face. Yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> you look mental. Like, you, you know, if you want a hobby, go and play Minecraft. But you're not taking a year out to like pursue this hobby. To be fair, you would have made more money in Minecraft. Yeah, yeah. I probably that's would. Big, also, big, also yeah. what year was this? This, this is... This is <laughs> Minecraft. What was that? Oh, Warhammer. That was that was cool. Warhammer like, was big. Warhammer go. was big. Yeah. There we go. Okay, Warhammer. Yeah. But um, and so like everything in African household is very much education, education, education. So to take a year out, that was like, why are you trying to bring shame to the family name? Like, what are you doing? So there's pressure as well. There was pressure, yeah. yeah. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to take a year out, and then I, I just went and did it, and I think four weeks into my first year. <clears throat> I broke my toe and I was out for four months. Mum's like, well done. Well yeah, done. you smashed it. Yeah. You shame the How family. How did you break your toe? Just, she, she, just the she, training. She did it. Yeah, she, she, came she did and it. stamped you. Go to uni. Go to uni. So I can't walk get and back, I have no degree. Get back in that, in that painting and room. I've, Paint that Warhammer. That's it. And I've shamed my family. I 
I wasn't even getting paid. In that photo, I wasn't even getting paid. <laughs> Oh, he's literally costed me. So you went to Harlequins, break it down. <laughs> Honestly, when you break it down, I oh. wasn't getting paid. I was living at home. Mum wanted me to go to university and I have a broken foot. <laughs> it was not a good start to a professional career. But you wanted to be a footballer before that. Yeah, I did. I, How like, good are you with football, actually? I, I was decent. I played to a real good level. And like every like rugby player will tell you, oh, I had trials. I, I did actually have trials. <laughs> and Who for? Um, Don't say Arsenal. Yeah, yeah Arsenal. there you go. I, yeah. <laughs> Genuine. Like, that's all I wanted to do. Who did you play with? Huh? Who did you try oh, with? Oh, they've all gone to make it. <laughs> all of them. Who, Tony yeah. Adams? <laughs> Tony Adams, uh, Nigel Winterburn. Um, Razor Ruddick. Oh, mean... <laughs> Razor, John Fashnu. Vinnie Jones. Vinnie Jones. You... <laughs> yes. I mean, they're all like 20 years older than me, but they've all got to make it. It's just, it's just a life I didn't want for myself. Burkamp was up and coming. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was in the academy. We were just trying to filter him into the team at that point. And it was a choice between him and I, and they just were <laughs> undecided. So, you know, I think they made the good choice at the end. But yeah, football I wanted to do, broke my toe. And then that gave me the ability. All I did that year was gym. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't run. And, and I needed to be a lot bigger, a lot mm. more robust. I then came back after being injured, having put on some size. I had trials of England under 19s and in the warm up, I broke my toe again. <laughs> For God's sake. <laughs> what are you on about? You Your toe it. wasn't ready for this what new mass that you put on. Like, you broke it again and tried what are, you do, what are you doing with your feet? I, I don't like know. Flailing around. Like. Honestly, it was like the weakest thing that my body possessed. It's like the Achilles water. toe. Honestly, I was just like this. Surely not. So I was out pretty much for a whole season. How old are you this one? <clears throat> 18. Yeah, 18. But this also happened. So this is 2001. I just watched the British and Irish Lions go down to um, Australia. They lost that series, but one of the players that Harlequins had was a player called Keith Wood, Irish hooker. Yeah, amazing. He was voted the world's best player. And he came back after that tour and had his 10th shoulder operation. Jesus. So I'd like come out of school fanboying about the Lions, watching Living the Lions on DVD, yeah. broke my toe, broke it again. And who's my training partner? Keith Wood, the world's best player. So he took me under his wing and I trained with him for the best part of six months. And that's why it was the best thing to happen to me. I didn't realise that at the time, but it was phenomenal. But if you want to understand what professionalism is and how to be better, and if you want to succeed in everything, why not learn off the world's best player? Mm. And in any <laughs> other circumstance, him and I would never have bonded. It was like, it's, yeah, it was, it, it just, it was just meant, it was meant to be in a, a roundabout way. And I, I, I still speak to him today. And whenever I see him, the only thing I've got is absolute adoration, love, and just gratitude because someone in his position looking after this little kid, he just didn't need to. And he helped me, drove me, and inspired me so much in that first year. Apparently he was a player who he, he would never stop. Never. As in like he would just keep going. And going, and yeah. going. He had this bald head and you would come out with yeah. cuts always <laughs> over his head the entire... But he was, yeah. according to everyone, and I think I've spoken to you about everyone else, he just was a machine. Absolute machine. Like, I thought I knew what hard work was at school, like go to the go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> <At school. laughs> you were lifting at school. I don't know anyone who went to the gym at school. Well, he was, he was kind of lifting, but not lifting. You know what yeah. the gym was like at school. Yeah. It was like, it was cool to have a gym at school, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like, that wasn't going to prepare me to be a professional rugby player or play internationally. And then I met him and he's like, yeah, I've kind of been operating at a pretty severe level. And I was like, wow, that was a surprise. I didn't know. And it was an expediated way of me learning the like fundamental requirements of how to be a professional rugby. I didn't know what being a professional was, like train hard, work hard, sleep, recovery. He just took me to places in my year one. And I'd, hey, I was a student a few months ago. I was doing my A-levels and now I'm working the world's best. And that's that's why, although that, <clears throat> that first year was so disappointed, no money, family shame, everything else, it was the best thing to happen to me. And that's where I kind of put on. So to give you a stat, so... How um, tall are you there? I, I mean, I... I think kind of stopped growing at that age. Like I don't. I was five foot six. Yeah. I'm now six foot. I'm six one and a half. 
really I just sprouted. Yeah. yeah, I just yeah, it was just you know, it was just the environment, just the environment. Ate really he was, well. He was a really great mentor. Yeah. Oh my gosh, he helped me grow metaphorically and quite simply physically. <laughs> what do you mean? I wasn't ten. So <laughs> was because I just I imagine you because you're so big. I got loads bigger that year. Bench press, I could on free weights. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Go on. I could push 60 yeah. kilograms. Like on a... At 18? Like, yeah. 60, that, that was it. 60. Yeah. But machine weights, I could probably lift a bit more, but free weights, you need the stability. By the end of that season, I could push 180. No, you're lying. Genuine. You could bench 180? 18, yeah. But what else could I do? I couldn't run. All uh-huh. I could do was weights. Weights and did some boxing and... Lots of swimming. I absolutely love that. I saw this thing the other day where <clears throat> there was this uh, there was this Hungarian guy who um, wanted to find out if it was nature or nurture that that creates talent, mm. right? So what he did is he wanted to do it with his own kids. Mm-hmm. So he married a teacher, and he decided just for the experiment, just yeah, for the experiment. Say, that's yeah. quite quite harsh he did. on her. He did. He <laughs> he married this. He married this girl, but then they fell in love and things like that. But he oh. did it for the experiment, and she agreed to it as well. They said, right, we're going to bring our kids up in um, a way where we're going to dedicate their lives to something certain that they are then going to become the greatest wow. at. And they chose chess, right? <clears throat> he had three daughters. The kids like sick. He had, yeah, he had three daughters. <laughs> What's a stitch up? He, he, <laughs> Chess. <laughs> this is the life of certainty. Yeah. yeah. Chess. What a football. What a stitch. <laughs> you could have picked anything. Why are you picking <laughs> just so hard. On this on this audio bit that I was listening to that said it last night, they went and he picked chess. <laughs> Such an anticlimax. Is that what you're talking about? His wife is thinking, you've brought me into this for a chess experiment. <laughs> I don't know if this is worth it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I got, I'm gonna, you can Google it. But um, he he got three daughters and he created an environment where they just played chess all the time. Oh, it was just chess boards everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Literally locked them in a room with and, chess No, boards. but they became chess masters and things like, like the youngest age of the youngest female champions ever and all these different things. I suppose my point is, is that what what did you, was yours natural talent? You were a footballer, you then picked up rugby. Was yours just natural talent or were you pushed into that sport? Well, your parents didn't want you to do it. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah parents didn't want me to do it. But I, were you I, always playing sport? I was always playing sport. And I've, there's a bit of a lineage of sport in, um, in, in the family. Like my cousin, he ran at the Atlanta Olympics for Nigeria. He got to the quarterfinals. And like Michael Johnson was an idol of mine. Michael Johnson, that Olympics... Home Olympics for him, ran for USA, broke the 200 and 400 meter world record. Mm. Never forget it. 1932 in the two, 43, 29 in the four. Ridiculous. That's outrageous. Yeah, I just like, just loved it. And then in the quarterfinals, I'm like, my cousin is at the Olympics mm. competing against a guy that I just, just admire. He's amazing. So there's always been people like that in our family. And <clears throat> natural ability only takes you so far. It will. It, do you uh, think it does though, or do, do, do you think that you can? Sound like Cipriani, right? That's natural ability. Natural. It's kind of it's natural ability twinned with loads of hard work. And I love watching. I I, lo- I love watching sport, and the best sports men and women make things look easy. But underneath all of that are just years and years of sacrifice. I always say, it, like, I was really fortunate enough to play for the British and Irish Lions and people might not know what that is. It's, it's a team that comes together once every four years from the best of Britain and Ireland. And we play against New Zealand, Australia and South Africa. And I, that was the best thing I ever did. You're playing with the best of the best of your generation. And I did that age 26 and I scored a try in a third test match intercept from like 70 meters. It was Unreal. wicked. So for ran me, the whole pitch. Yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. Yeah, it was like it was wicked moment, really cool moment. But to run that seventy meters is about six and a half seconds. Mm. But to get to that point, it took me thirteen years. Mm. But people just see me catch a ball, run, put it down, and be like, "That was cool." And it's a moment. But if I had to do those thirteen years again for those six and a half seconds, I'd repeatedly do it for the rest of my life because it was the greatest moment that I had on a rugby pitch. So when people think of moments, Beckham, when he scores a free kick against Greece, um, against Greece to get to a World Cup, and it's like from from him kicking the ball into the nets three seconds, but how long? Johnny Wilkinson kicking a drop goal to win a World Cup final. People could have a glimpse into his life and mind and the sacrifice he put himself in for a moment. And all you ever do is prepare yourself enough to hope to have an opportunity to have a moment 
And that's where natural ability will take you so far. But unless you dedicate slash sacrifice yourself to that craft, you might never get that moment. That's a lot. I love that. That actually all your, your sacrifice of life leads you to moments. Mm. And that's a really, that's a great thing. I didn't think of it that way, that those little moments, even though it's a moment for audience members or for colleagues or people to experience, you've actually been dedicated your life towards that one moment. Of course, we watch Usain Bolt break a world record. We're like, look at him, he's doing all of this and he breaks a world record and it's like absolute exhilaration for just over nine seconds. For the last four years, he's put in a lot more Mm. than nine seconds to have that moment. And I don't know, I, I, I work in sports media now and I, we talk about loads of highlights and all we see in consumer just highlights. But if you scratch a surface, um, what you see is something which not a lot of people are willing to do. So people say to me, like my son or my daughter wants to play rugby and I'm like, my question is, are they willing to put the work in to be a professional? Because everyone wants to be Usain Bolt, be Cristiano Ronaldo. Are you willing to work as hard as him? Are you willing to dedicate sacrifice? And that's the only question I ever pose back to people that say they want it. People, I want to be a boxer. Do you want to be smacked in the head as much and train and do everything? Because Tyson Fury is really cool. So is Colin McGregor and all the rest of it. You want that moment of holding up a belt and being celebrated. That's wicked. We all chase that. We all want those moments. But... Are you willing to put the work in to get yourself to that moment? Because if you're not, then don't tell me you want to play rugby because you don't. You actually don't. Yeah, it's so true. People, people, um, uh, uh, people want to obtain the the, the goal, mm. right? But actually, they don't realise what happens behind closed doors. You don't see mm. it. It's they, not documented. It do, it's not documented. But with you, you, you then must have been putting in the work the entire time, realising that you wanted to go professional. Because I think, especially with professional rugby. My experience is you suddenly become professional. Mm. You, it's not one of these things like football where you have academies at early ages and they sort your, of take your it. experience. <laughs> when, <laughs> yeah. when did you go professional? Yeah, so, motherfucker. Sorry, I missed that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> missed that. Missed I that would have been great. I would have been great. <clears throat> I would have been great. Yeah. I, don't, don't you? No, no, no. You had you had a bad knee. Injury. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Don't just. It's yeah. the only reason. Yeah, yeah. That is the only reason. Yeah. Yeah. It's simply the only reason. <laughs> it's yeah. the only, Full stop. It is. It's actually the only reason. There's no need to talk about it. <laughs> How bad was the knee? When I, <clears throat> play, I played, we, I played. You should in, have seen the greys. <laughs> <laughs> the nurse was honestly there for literally ages. I'll she, tell you what happened. I'll tell you what happened. Okay. Okay. So, did me. you listen? Yeah, I will. I will tell you. All right. Listen up, children. Settle in. Listen, listen, listen. I was, I was great. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, was great. I was. I was. I was great. I was great. And, um, I, uh, you played England 16. Played England you, 16. You were, you were a bit of an athlete, weren't you? I was. I, I, I still hold the school. I still hold. I got this up the other day. I, I still hold the school's javelin under te, under twelve record. Under twelve, like yeah. That. Okay, and and just <laughs> we, we've turned it. We, he's we, he's eleven year old javelins. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds really responsible. And actually. look, I, you know it's not. It's because I'm going to say I still hold hold the record. I then got sent. A, um, a, a message from my uh, old athletics coach when I was um, 8 to 12. Yeah. I'm going to read you this, what he said. Please. Okay, you ready for this? This is just, this is just athletics. This is a little snippet mm-hmm. of what I was like as an athlete. Yeah. <clears throat> Jamie's athletic prowess is quite outstanding. Mm. He has represented the school in athletic competition at every age. He has incredible speed endurance and mass self-motivation and drive. Ready? C- continues. <clears throat> Ready? Great. Yeah, here you go. <laughs> Under 40... Oh, no, hold on. Just wait. <laughs> Just getting to the good bit. Uh, despite being some despite two... Despite being really terrible at reading. <laughs> very... <laughs> <laughs> it excels on the pitch. I went to an event, this is... Despite being some two years younger than the oldest boys that year, he also shattered, shattered... Wow. ...the 1,500 metre record while running at Radley. He was only beaten by one of the other boys who were three years older than him. That nice. is amazing. Yeah, that's that is amazing. Well, well and and I and I hold the javelin record for under under twelves. I threw it thirty one point two meters. Still the ho- oldest record. Did you held. peak at twelve? No, I didn't peak at twelve. <laughs> and then and then when I then I played loads Imagine of rugby. Imagine getting to twelve and peaking. <laughs> <laughs> that's it for life. This is it, lads. <laughs> Finally, finally made it. I, I, do you know how far I threw a cricket ball at 12? I don't know. 
Funny enough, I don't know the answer to this. Really, really fucking fair. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely don't. Guess. What do you guess? What do you guess? How far can I throw a cricket ball at 12? I, 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 reckon, I reckon twice the distance of the javelin, maybe three times. Three hundred meters. Yeah. <laughs> you think I threw mate, mate, you were, a cricket you were ball? You a superhuman at twelve. You, you think so I freak. threw a cricket ball hundred meters? No, no, all right, sixty-five. I'm gonna say fifty-two. Yeah, yeah, fifty-two meters. That's why I threw a cricket he ball. Did, I did know. He did know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did know. <laughs> so my is point is that the truth. Yeah, it's the truth. Well, wow. no, it's the truth. My point is, I then played a lot of rugby. I then did schools, England schools. I then was on tour in Italy with my rugby team. I caught the ball. I ran around the pitch. I sidestepped around this guy. As I sidestepped around him, he even said, God, that guy's good. As when, when did you did, learn to uh, He did. Home? As I sidestepped the guy, the, the, as I left him in the dust, the he went... Italian? N- yeah, he, was, he said it in Italian. I translated <laughs> that quickly in my head as well. And, he, and as I sidestepped, he went, he went, oh, that's uh, so good. <laughs> Oh, that's just so good. <laughs> and then... He plays Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> Super Mario Brothers. And then I, I did my ACL ligament and again, I never it's played like again. Because there was a banana. <laughs> banana skin that you slipped over. <laughs> oh, that's a me. <laughs> that was goddamn Italian. And then, and then the, the second time I played after that was when you and I played... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Was this when you got absolutely oh smashed? You got, I got floored. I got, we played. What was it? Uh, uh, rugby. What, rugby. What, what was the guy called? The New, oh, a, the New gosh. Zealander. No, that, not that other time. We're going to talk oh about the other gosh, time. Yeah, rugby. Aid. Rugby. Aid. Brad Thorne. Brad, Brad, Brad Thorne. He's like six foot eight. He's won the World Cup in rugby league and rugby union. One of the great forwards of the modern game. And Jamie decided to have a small altercation with him. <laughs> I ran, I ran at him. I ran at him, and I can only describe what I did. I was running across the pitch. I saw Uke, and he was actually like, "You even went past me the ball," <laughs> and I ran past you and almost went fuck off. <laughs> oh, no. And I, your life depends on it. Pass me the only, fucking ball. And the only thing I did is what I can describe as a basketball shot. I tried to do a basketball shot over him, which is the worst thing you can do because you just reveal your yeah, body. And, yeah. he, and he hit me so hard in the tackle that it cracked three of my ribs. Yeah. He folded him up like a warm tortilla. <laughs> it's a six foot Listen, eight New Zealander. I mean, what were you thinking? What I would so, say about Jamie though, is that after that hit and like you break three of your ribs, like mm. that is, that's tough to take. Mm. You didn't come off the pitch mm-hmm. and then you made a try saving tackle like yeah. later on. Like yeah. fair play to you because, you know, whatever your teacher's name, age, when you're age 12, Dom, Dom. like that's, that is yeah. like tip my hat to you. Like that was wicked to be able to do that. Do that. Uh, I'd we... have been off. I was having this conversation actually. <laughs> Who's I was, Sam Warburton, ex uh, Wales captain, did a show of him on, on Sunday, and I don't know if you can see those two fingers. Yeah, one's what? crooked. Yeah, one's really crooked. No, that didn't notice it. <laughs> that didn't notice <laughs> it looks totally normal. And, um, it looks really weird. What is I, that? I know it's horrible. So I played a game against Exeter, and I dislocated this finger. And like, I'm just like, absolute pussy. <laughs> so you so it's like popping out here and the physios come on. I'm just like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> Why are you making those noise? I, I was just in agony, but I've tried to internalise it. Don't let the opposition not, not see very it. Well. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like you're trying to hold face. a sneezing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm like looking at the physio. He's like, run on. I was like, oh, obviously I'm being substituted. <laughs> can't play on with this. And he just straps it to my finger and I hold his hand to like take me off the pitch. And he was like, what are you doing? I said, well, obviously I have to come off the pitch. Obviously, where's the ambulance? I need- yes. Where's St. John's? <laughs> you like, held his hand. Yes. Because like, you were going to be taken off yeah. I was like, obviously I'm coming off. And he was like, no, no, you're staying on the pitch. And so I stayed, honestly, I, I stayed on. I played terribly out of protest. <laughs> yeah, just dropping every ball. So, it's not me, it's, the, it's the finger. Yeah. You soaked on the pitch. Yes. Can you imagine this, this, this man baby just played like a weapon. I was like, I have to go off the pitch. And oh, you, you, you see, I was I was paid to be on the pitch and wanted to come off. Like, rugby aid was for charity, <laughs> and you <laughs> broke your ribs and stayed on the pitch just because you wanted to. Oh, What's the difference, oh, buddy. Listen, we've got to stop there for part one. We're going to come back for part two, right? When we're going to talk about the fact that when we were naked in a sauna together, I want to hear about Japan. I really want to. Hear we were naked Japan. in a sauna together, and uh, I got to see the mamba. <laughs> we'll see you in part two, everybody.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back to part two of Private Parts, the podcast where nothing is off limits. <laughs> Thank you, Ventura. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Sorry, I just said it. Yeah, <laughs> nothing's <laughs> off limits on this podcast. <laughs> that doesn't sound like it was a decision like we made together. <laughs> Apparently, it's not. Um, okay. Um, I've got a question for you. Here's a question because lots of people don't know this. How do you pronounce your first name? <laughs> is it Ugo mm. or is it Hugo? I don't know. Gen- <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? I genuinely don't know. Because my full name is actually Ugo Chuku. Ugo Chuku. Yeah. Ugo Chuku. Why don't you? Why don't you have that? Ugo Chuku. Um, I don't know. <laughs> you didn't like it. Um, I don't know. Just I've always just been called. See, this is it. So I said Ugo Chuku. So I probably. Ugo? Yeah, it's Ugo. I've always said, I've always said Ugo, but people say Ugo. Mm. I said it's Yu-Gi-Oh. 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 I like Yu-Gi-Oh. Yu-Gi-Oh. You sound like, Yu-Gi-Oh. You sound like a Pokemon. Can we, yeah, can we go with that? <laughs> yeah, Yu-Gi-Oh. You want to go Yu-Gi-Oh? Yu-Gi-Oh. No, Yu-Gi-Oh. 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 <laughs> well, Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> See, I genuinely don't mind, just so long as it's not Hugo. And it's <laughs> That's so not fun. your name. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's Hugo. 100%. <laughs> well, thankfully, you'll be fine. <laughs> yes. Because like like, I'll go, I don't know, check into a hotel, and they'll be like, oh, what's your name? I'll be like, oh, it's Hugo. And they'll go, oh, Hugo. And I'm like, no, can you just repeat what I said to you? <laughs> I didn't say that. I genuinely didn't say that. Hi, oh, what's your name? Annabelle. Hi, Hannah. <laughs> no, you just, like... It's, just, it's a slightly bigger leap. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I exaggerated. Hey, for, I exaggerated for effect. Okay, let me breathe. <laughs> Slightly bigger leap. Uh, um, let me breathe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to. I want to hear about you guys in Japan. Oh, we had it. We had a. Well, you can explain it better. We had but a it great sounded time. Fucking great. It was. It was one of the funnest trips. I have honestly ever had in just lots of ways. But have you, you ever been to Japan? No, I've never been. I've never been to Japan. So it was ahead <laughs> of the, the the World Cup in 2019. And I got this piece of work commissioned and they said, I oh, would like to take like a non-professional out, but a, prof- a non-professional that likes rugby. And I was like, Jamie. Can I just quickly say before we went on the trip, it was with O2, right? And yes. and he's still being paid by them. Yeah. And Ugo had um had uh Ugo had, had um O2. commissioned it. He had commi- their reception is he, great. He had commissioned, he's like, Jamie, listen, it's gonna happen, it's really great. Then what happened was about a month before I did a job with with uh, with EE and he phoned me and went, I believe it. Tell me you haven't just done a job with <laughs> EE. And I went, Yeah, yeah. And he went, What about our O2 job coming yes. up? Might have cancelled the whole thing. And I was like, Well, so I didn't realise that. <laughs> Jamie, Jamie needs to eat. Okay? You're, just a, you're a network whore. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. A network whore. But anyway, so, we go out there, what happens? So we go out there and we had loads of different things. So it was trying to twin the values of the country with the values of the England rugby team. But she had values. It was oh, yes, that's loyalty, it. respect. respect. It's like the core oh, values that underpin like their culture. Right. British. Okay. And the English, like the RFU, Rugby Football Union's values are called treads, which are teamwork, respect, enjoyment, Discipline, sportsmanship. It's, it's quite, it is quite a disciplined, it's, it's, rigid society, isn't it, Japan? Like that was my perception, and and it is into a to a certain extent. But I've never met. Do you know where you go on holiday? Yeah, that was, it was it was um sorry, guys, you're, sorry. it was loyalty, <laughs> honor, respect, um, and justice, manners. and and yeah. anyway, it's these these it's basically these amazing things that you live by. Mm. That was the whole point of it. So we went and did loads of different activities, which would display them. So we met um. Buddhist monk who met uh, a modern day lady samurai in a bamboo forest. Why not? <laughs> Went sumo wrestling. This guy was massive. This well, guy was, uh, the, he, really? he was. Well, yeah, as you, as you can imagine. He's a cool, he was a Yokozuna. Yokozuna effectively means there is only one. He was the grandmaster. And we walked into this room and the size of this man's back was like this couch, yeah. which I'm sat on. But he was, I, I thought he was stood up when he was sat down. He mm. was so big. And we walked in and we'd actually been sumo wrestling the day before and I like rocked up the next day, like a bit of a... So a competitive. He's so competitive. <laughs> Most competitive thing I've ever seen. It, it's Firstly, there's loads of things. Sorry to go. Firstly, firstly, you can't... If you if you have tattoos, you're you're considered part of... Um, gang. Gang. The your gang. The Yakuza. Yes. Yeah. So, we, so no tattoos were on show, um, which was the first thing. Secondly... Um, didn't like that. <laughs> they didn't One like, place allowed me to fight. Yeah. The only the only thing that I can <clears throat> describe is you have um, you have Ugo there, and then you have the, uh, the sumo wrestler. Did on you the go other up side. against the giant? 
The, no, 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 he was retired. But he, he went up to one of their sort of um, prodigies, and this guy was like a, a proper sumo wrestler. It was honestly like two trucks. You, 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 you know, if you've ever seen sumo wrestling, you sort of stand, you put your fingers on the ground next to each other, and you go in sort of a ruck formation against each other, and you basically have to push each other either mm. to the floor or outside of the circle. But what's more brutal than that? So you're like crouched down, and you almost lead with your head, and so many bouts are lost or one between these two people coming together and they just go head on head, someone gets knocked unconscious. Yeah. Like bulls. That's, yes. a, that's literally what it is. So what you try yeah. and do is the sumo rest is you try and knock their head straight away. Right. You go straight. In. These, so you, you, you have Ugo and this other guy. Honestly, <laughs> it was so aggressive and so frightening. And Ugo <laughs> refused. And then when he threw this guy, who's meant to be like the next big thing out of the circle. Oh, did you do, did he, you do it, him? Yeah, he, he went, he went we're all around, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Tats on this show. Guy, yeah. We're learning about respect and I'm like, in your face, <laughs> in your face, I've ended your career. <laughs> yes. This guy was so, felt so much disrespect. Oh, I couldn't yes. believe it. But but this uh, the sumo wrestler was insane. He was like 28 stone or something like that. It was crazy. But he was like, he was really cool. And then they do, small little exercise to demonstrate. We watch them. The one thing I didn't realise how flexible they are, they're like, some of them are like 170, 180, top in 200. The old dude, the grandmaster was like 280, as you said, mm. but they can all do the splits. <laughs> and yeah. they're all like, because you look <laughs> at them. That would be so off-putting. Like, yeah, it's, it's really doing? odd. Yeah. But it was amazing, this guy in his hands, I can't tell you, he was, it, it was, and it was so big, like basketball hands. And we, we met this guy and then, we also went up to a a sauna, salt baths. <laughs> and, nice. And, Got and, salty. And you have You're to go. Salty. You have to go into these salt baths completely nude. They didn't tell us. They didn't tell us. Uh, so, two, what do you like? Once again, like there is a link of like nappies and like just kind of going back to your younger self. <laughs> so you go in, you have a shower, and you sit on a potty. <laughs> Body and you shower yourself. What, what before and, you go in the bath? And Ugo and I are standing there, so then you go into the bath. And, and meanwhile, you know, we, we've known each other over the years, but we haven't spent a whole trip together, right? We've, we've never gone on holiday. Yeah, you've, you've, not new, you've not knew and, salt. And we are standing <laughs> next to each other. And I'm, I'm, shock, I'm white. And uh, <laughs> also, also a very white man. Yeah, very well. white man. Very white. And Ugo's black and he's six foot five and I'm five foot eight on a good day. And we're standing next to each other. We couldn't look more opposite, and we're completely nude having a conversation in these Japanese salt baths. <laughs> it was wild. And then, and then I turn around and I turn back, and who goes doing a man join? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. If there's any way to break I've actually, the ice, it's... I've actually got the phone. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it was just, it was just a, a remarkable trip. When did the, like they should have briefed us? I guess the point of briefing us, you didn't want to brief someone too much because you wanted every they reaction. Get, they get a lob on. Jay, Jay would be, uh, Jay would be warming up. It <laughs> comes mean, out with an erection. They didn't tell oh, us. Fuck. They didn't tell us anything. No, because I remember just like walking through, like been to spas before, and I'm just there, like little tighty whities on and whatnot walk through and they're like okay cool you just need to get ready i'm like bro i've just had a shower on the potty i have my trunks i've on. never seen a bigger willy in my life <laughs> honestly, it was, honestly i couldn't but it was like your penis had been in the weights room I didn't, it's like your penis well, had well, a, essentially it has I, I even said does your penis have a peloton subscription because honestly it's been, peloton. It's, it's been peca, spinning or something i don't know what was going on <laughs> It's unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, so, I think it's fair to say. So you guys got to know each other. We did, and we really have harnessed the values of Bushido. <laughs> Respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like you really tuned no, in. But we that. were. We, we got to say this, we were incredibly respectful. And it was an amazing yeah. experience. We re we, and we had this amazing time, and it then was put up there too, and it was really well received by the whole... Uh, everyone loved it. The hardest thing to feel that day was is us being naked, but then being able to put it onto YouTube. I know. And so we're walking around, and one of us might just turn around. The camera's like... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make your way. <laughs> yeah, but the good. but the best thing was is then we went and played this rugby match. <laughs> so you can explain this again. So in Japan, like rugby's a big deal mm. there for them, and they're hosting the World Cup. But not they don't have grass everywhere. But it's not an excuse for them because they're double art, and so they play on gravel. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, they do. They play on gravel. So they were like, um, Jamie, you go. You're both going to play on a side. And I was like, cool, where's the pitch? They're like, that was, that's a car park. I'm not playing a car park. What, what shoes do you wear to play in gravel? Like? I wore trainers. <laughs> and at this point, after sumo wrestling, which is done on sand, you're doing so much pushing and shoving, the level of abrasion on my toes. I know I'm a pussy. I spoke about my Your toes finger. have been an issue throughout your yes. life. <laughs> yes, they have. So I'd split and blistered but the, the undersides of my toes and then they got infected. But I, could, I was like struggling to walk. They were absolutely disgusting. So what better antidote for it than playing a game of rugby on, on gravel? So we both picked a side. And this was a day after Jamie... In fairness to Jamie, we played inside, didn't we, mm. the day before? <laughs> yes. And Jamie beat about 10 defenders, combined age of about 32. <laughs> <laughs> they were, they were rinsing they, kids for fun and celebrating. It's like when Boris Johnson body checks that small they, they child. Were eight, they were eight years old. He was smoking and had fist bumping himself. They were, they were six to eight year olds, and I sprinted around them and scored and celebrated. And Yuka was so angry at me for doing it. He's like, What are you doing? Because our team were really good. Like, we had some wicked players. And then Jamie scores like a last minute try and celebrates to crush these Japanese kids' hearts. I was like, Jamie, what are you doing? Literally. So we then played this rugby match we're playing on gravel and you've got an ex-England ex-Lion professional right who 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 is is you know he's just sort of left being pro he catches the ball on the on the uh 20 yard line and runs and break these guys were good players he breaks through every single tackle it's it's like a steam train he's running through starts everyone and there's only the fullback left the fullback is me. <laughs> so, so he goes running straight at me, straight at me, all filmed, straight at me. We're on gravel. And I'm thinking, well, I'm going to have to take him low here because he's running. It was honestly like... Have you seen the film Backdraft? <laughs> no. Yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They open the door. Oh, it was like that. He ran in straight over me. I think, is, <laughs> there, is there footage of this? Yeah, yeah. I think I've seen it. There, <laughs> there is footage. You like, you have rigor mortis. You <laughs> <laughs> like straight over. The thing is, I genuinely like... I wanted to play, but I didn't want to play rugby because the first time I got the ball, like I'm now just this target. So I get tackled. I land on my elbow, bang, split my elbow, full of blood. I'm just like, this is calamity. I'm just like, this is rubbish. Can we just get, can we just get like the footage we need? And then, so I'm just like, oh, I just, I really don't want to like, this is terrible me saying this, but it's true. It's how I felt. I was like, I don't want to go on the floor again. Like, and then they kick the ball over my head. I'm like, I'm actually going to have to run with the ball. And so, so I did. That's the only reason I ran. I, I was just happy to catch him. He pass ran that. through the whole team. The whole team. What was your hundred meter time back in the day? Ten six. He's ten six. He's, ten, six. he's six at two, and he's like fifteen stone. And I was like, "Well, I've got him." <laughs> like, honestly, was straight this before or after Brad Thorne. This was a bef- this after Brad Thorne. Is, yeah. Oh, but it was just it was this amazing trip, and and just so like, what I always fun. find, um, buddy, is like when you leave a sport, mm-hmm. do you, how much do you miss it? Um, I don't miss playing. I don't because I think when you, when you dedicate yourself to something so for so long, there is this, in, this unquenchable thirst for, for just more. Like all I want to do is play for Quinns. I did play for Quinns. I want to play for England. I want to do that more. I want to play for like, where does it stop? So there's always a little bit of that, but I always say like, I've moved on without moving too far away. I still heavily involved in rugby. What I miss is um, like the changing room. I miss the changing really? room. Really? Oh. Like people, it, was, what, it was a nice changing room. Or? You just like <laughs> love the feng shui of it. Just the decor. It's amazing. It's a little bit like this, actually. Lovely. Is, is it just the, it's the, it's the camaraderie? 100%. So a lot of people ask me like, um, so I played at Harlequins 14 years and we won the Prem back in 2012. And, the, and that was like my favourite day playing for Quinns. What was your best moment on that day? I think people expect me to talk about when the final whistle went and we lift the trophy and like 80,000 people in the stadium and just doing that. And that was special. But actually it was walking down the tunnel, walking into the change room, shutting the door and just that sense of satisfaction. Mm. Because you're surrounded by everyone that put everything in to that success. And my team, I'd grown up with everyone. So it was wicked. And it's those moments. And I'm like, it's really weird. I'm fascinated by change rooms because they're... You're, oh, you're a complete freak <laughs> total freak total freak but like you know I work in media we want to put microphones and cameras everywhere to be able to mm. see and bring people close to the game 
But in a change room, if those changing rooms could speak, it would be the most compelling film and story you'd mm. ever have heard or watched in your life. Because I've had the darkest days, mm. the darkest days in those change rooms, and I've had the best highs, and they're all contained within those change rooms, totally away from every camera, just the people who were there. And that sense of unity and that level of camaraderie is, is what I miss. It's a bus trip back from Manchester after a good win and there's a few beers and a couple of pizzas. That's what I miss about the game. There's probably been three or four games and I've been retired six years, which I wish I played in. But that feeling that you get when you're part of something is mm. it's hard to it's also There's also this conversation, right? And this is a little bit deeper behind, you know, how old were you when you retired? 32. I was you, you're like 32. Young, okay, yeah. so you're 32 when you retire. Yeah. You know, rugby we know is like a pretty, it's a physical sport. So mm. your body is pretty battered. Yeah. 32 is... Back surgery two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. There you go. You know, your feet, whatever it is. This happens a lot. And that's, you know, rugby, there's all sports. But um, 32 is, that's your beginning of your life. And you're quitting a life already to then start a new life. And I know with you, you're, you're, you're not lucky at all because you're hard at work. You're great with you. You're presenting BT Sport. You're doing question of sport. You're doing Strictly. You're all over the shot. You're, you're the front and center of everything to do with sport and TV and everything at the moment. And, it, and it's super proud to see. But for the individuals who don't have that opportunity and they have to leave what they love behind. Dark. It's dark, right? And there's this big thing now about with all sports, not just rugby, but all sports, NFL, you know, all over the world. There's huge mental health when it comes to this area. So how do we how do we challenge that? It's really tough. I think every pro sports person when they retire will suffer. Um, Did maybe, you suffer? Um, fit, like physic physically, I think you, you suffer in one of three things: physically, financially, or emotionally, mentally. I've had friends that have had all three of those things, like whether friends of mine that need shoulder replacement, hip replacement. And so that's the physical side of it or not quite sure their sense of direction, what they're going to do next. That can lead to depression. Mm. Um, and so they, they are connected in some sense. I, I, I've been pretty fortunate if I've suffered in any of those three things, it just be my body. Like I've been very fortunate that I've been able to, so I retired in 2015 and yeah, 2015, my, the first job I did after that was working on the World Cup. That's, that's amazing. Like, been really fortunate and I've worked hard ever since there. But if you're retiring mid-30s, if you think if you didn't play sport, you went to uni and you took on a life which a majority of people take on, in your mid-30s, you're probably trying to peak. Mid-30s, you're resuscitating and starting a new career. And that is tough. The other thing is... I. I think there's a sense of um, like emotional going cold turkey. Every Saturday at three o'clock, I had a shot of adrenaline go from my body, ran out to the crowd, buzzing. That bath. endorphin buzz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's right. crazy, right? And then it's gone. <laughs> yes. Then it's gone. So my week was focused on what I tried to do every single Saturday at three o'clock. Bang, just win, 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 everything. And then that goes and then you lose that sense of purpose and the kind of human scaffolding which you have around you, which is your team. Yes. And you're on your own and you don't have a sense of purpose. And I'm actually doing a job which I don't like because I've played rugby since the age of six. That was my life. Who am I? What am I doing? And your job becomes who you are as a person. Hi, I'm Hugo, rugby player. Like everyone, you're just Hugo, the rugby player. And then you're not. So when I retired, when people asked me what I did, I said I played rugby. I'd I didn't know what else to say. Yeah. And it, I, the fact is, I, no one needs to introduce themselves like it's this human LinkedIn transaction. Hi, I'm such and such. I run this business. Hi. But you don't. But there is such um, a sense of who you are yeah. is your job because that's what you're known for. That's what your drive is. That's your raison d'etre. Like that's, that's it. That is it. And then it goes. Like one of the hardest days, silly, was when I got booted out of the WhatsApp group. I'd been retired three days. What? What's that? I was like, oh, excuse me? What's that? But all my mates, I was just like, what? Oh my God. But, all but those... it's not out of it. It's not out of it. It's just because you're not the, the part of the not team. There. Not there. Not part of the team. Mm. You guys are in and that's it. So it's kind of losing that. And lots of people who have been in the army, they talk about it and it's not that different. And it is, it's, it is, it's, it's, it's a real big challenge, but... 
But it's, it's something that I'm really passionate about because I know that I've been fortunate enough to transition from one career into another. But I also don't want to spend the second part of my life looking back and reliving everything that I did. Mm. Um, which a lot of people do. Th- they do, and therefore you, you probably, ugh, I don't know. It's and not yours nice... wasn't stripped away from, from injury either, really. No, look, I, I got offered a new contract to stay on, and, um, and I decided I want to try and do something else, and there's a million one reason why I did it. My mum said I should crack on. She first said I shouldn't play rugby, and then I said I'm going to stop, and then she was no, no, crack on. So. <laughs> but, but that's also anxiety-driven, because you're waiting from, oh, you're waiting from contract to contract. Well, and, you, and you're coming to the end of your contract in any sport again, and you know this because you're in the sport, you're just waiting, I don't know if I'm going to be signed again. Yeah, you, I don't know, I think really good professionals almost make themselves redundant. I, I signed my last contract, age 29, three years, and oh, I cracked on, but I think what you want to do is then hand on the baton to the next person to be able to fill your shirt, your shoes, and then continue the club's success so there is a part of you when you get to the end of your career you actually need to give up some of yourself for the benefit mm. of the next person where i'm not sure there's many industries Can- like you guys on this podcast mm. if in five ten years there were a couple of like young guns on the beat jamie would never give it up <laughs> he literally his face would be hanging off and he's still- in rugby mm-hmm. can you obviously we talk, can you be financially sound Forever, if you want to be. I think there's limited people that can. We're not talking football money here where Mm. you can retire and just go, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, it doesn't matter because I've been earning millions of pounds since I was a teenager. Don't have that financial security. But in one way, it's really good to not have that level of um, apathy about what you do because it means that you need to get up and get up and discover what you want to do next. Age 29, signed three years, and I was like, I'm either going to continue playing rugby at 32 because my body's great and I love what I do, or I'm going to spend three years figuring out what I want to do. And my strategy was I wanted to find out what I didn't like rather than what I did like. We've all had like ex-partners where when you realise, like, I never, ever want that again in my life. And so you never look at it. So I looked at loads of different industries, and then I, I kind of stumbled into what I do now, media career. Um, someone, good friend of mine, I work, a guy called Nick Mullins, his wife spoke to Nick and said, I reckon you go be a good broadcaster. So he went for coffee in Twickenham, sat down, he said, I think you should give this a crack. And I was like, go on then. Worked really hard whilst I played, trying to upskill myself. Found that I really, it, actually all I wanted to do was figure out whether I'd enjoy it. So if I thought I'd enjoy it, I knew I'd, could be okay at it and I had a sense of fun so it's like sweet and now kind of all I want to do is work with good people and have fun on what I do that is it <clears throat> excuse me sorry you're choking up <laughs> yeah I'm just getting a bit emotional <laughs> that's literally all I want to do work with good people have fun with what I do and I know not everyone can do that there'll be a point in my life where maybe all I need to focus on is getting bills paid mm. but up until that point I'm just going to try and live in that world. What's more nerve wracking? Playing premiership final, playing for the Lions, broadcasting your first ever live show, or doing Strictly Come Dancing? <laughs> hmm. And be honest. Strictly. <laughs> Hands down. I know. Hands down. I know. Go on, tell me. Like, it's the worst thing in the world, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the worst thing. No one, you can't. To everyone listening to everyone in this room, you can't bottle the, the, the fear of doing Strictly Come Dancing, can you? There's so much to it. They talk about being strictly fired, don't they? Yeah. And they're like, we'll ease you in. And so week one and the kind of wardrobe team that are there are wicked. Vicky Gill, mm. Ezra. I, I, I love them. Like, I absolutely love them. And you go in for your fitting and I'm an electric pink sheer... <laughs> top so when you get fitted and like i'm sure most men have been fitted whether it's a foot suit or whatever and your neck your waistline your chest i've never been measured from my collarbone to my belly button and they wanted aggressive deep v shirts on me like, who does that who, who does that so week one i'm dressed like 
as a Pink Panther <laughs> with the most aggressive deep V trying to do the samba. Like, really? What is that <laughs> measurement? Ask, I challenge any man to tell me their collarbone to their belly button measurement. I tell my shoe size, waist, neck, collarbone to, to belly button, collar button to navel. Collie button. <laughs> <laughs> collie button to navel. What's your collie button? <laughs> collie button to navel. <laughs> Measurement, please. What are you doing? And you were with um, OT. Yes. She was a uh, crown champion two years in a row. Big, yeah. big boots to fill. Yeah, I know. She let me down, didn't she? <laughs> she did. She did. She let you down. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I was like, babe, we're obviously going to win this. I just need you to show up. And she didn't. <laughs> Outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> she it, it's um it's it's an amazing but bizarre but also just it's, the experience is is hectic right how would you how what was it like it was the you? most consuming thing i've ever done in yeah. my life yeah but really? yeah i mean it's you can't you can't do anything else the way in which i try and explain it so i would train 25 hours a week to play a rugby match 25 hours 80 minutes of rugby i was doing 40 45 hours of dancing for 90 seconds mm. It's it wild. was, it mm. was well, and also what happens is you go into like your first thing and you get given the samba and you think, oh, I've got interviews here, interviews there, this can be really fun. First uh, rehearsal, you come out and go, cancel everything. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking cancel it all. Cancel it all. <laughs> cancel it all. <laughs> cancel everything. Uh, I need, I think we're not going to sleep. sleep. <laughs> what the hell are we doing here? And, and then when you, then when you have two weeks on the first dance to learn, because you learn, you have two weeks to learn your first dance. When you go into week two, you only have one week, which is half the amount of time, obviously. You, you, Good maths. Yeah, I know, they killed it. You never think in a million years that you're going to get it right. And no. you, even before the show, you're like, I don't even know what I'm doing here. But you feel like you can build week on week. So we did two weeks of samba. I was like, okay, cool. Didn't know that. I mean, imagine two weeks of giving everything, <laughs> sleeping, tiredness, soreness, all the rest of it. You dance in front of like almost 10 million people and you're like, right, okay, judges. <laughs> I've put everything in, but you don't get marked on the effort you put in because yeah, everyone yeah. would be a 10. I'm like that first show. Okay, first goal of the series. Three. What? <laughs> Sick. Yes. I was like, no, no, pick up your proper paddle. Come on. It must be out of five, yeah. Love yeah. a long. <laughs> Love a gag. This is not banter. Three. Three is so shit. Did you get three? I never got three. Honestly, I was like, ah. three is literally because also what they do is they go, oh God, we just, four is like that. Four. When they give a three, they're like, that is toss. What they just start <laughs> feigning an injury. Ah, ah. If it wasn't televised, <laughs> the three is the equivalent of him coming across and just headbutting me. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks I've disrespected <laughs> his, and his industry. <laughs> Yeah, he wants to guff on my face and headbutt me. That's what he wants to do. He's he's not even annoyed. He's so angry that I've anger. decided. That's anger. Yeah, he's like that. Three, wow. So I get a three. I'm like, but you know, they've got a tight shot of your face and so you pull the tight smile. <laughs> yeah. It's fine. Hold it's it fine. together. Hold it together. How are my tears rolling into the back of my head inside my body because I have to internalise all this pain? And I have to, it's fine. And then you go to chat to Claudius, like, what about the judges? And then you don't want to anger them, like, because they have to judge you for the rest of the thing. Yeah. I was, oh, it's fine. I mean, I just respect all, I just respect the judges' comments. It's fine. Hey, it's subjective, dance subjective, isn't it? So it's fine. No fine. one, no one realises the amount of, because you just see the 90 seconds. No one realises how much commitment goes behind closed doors. And the it's dancers amazing. themselves, the professionals, like, oh. not only are they dealing Muppets like me, they're then... So on a Sunday, you have a day off. They're back in the studio choreograph the next week. It's it's amazing. And it, it is it is amazing. It's one of the shows that I've done whereby everyone actually just wants you to get better. And it's mm. really positive. It is so challenging. Mm. So challenging. And like that first week, I remember I, my dad passed away a couple of weeks previous. Mm. And I had my dad's funeral three hours before I had to do the first dance. Jesus. So I'm like this. Like, wow. how did you do that, buddy? Mate, I, I genuinely still don't know. Genuinely, not. That's, a, not a, that's, a, that's your. That's a lot to do. That's your. Day. That's your. Um, that's your sporting ability. That's your sporting mentality. Just going right. This is a. This is a job that I got to get done. Yeah, I had to. You try and compartmentalize things and just get on with things. And actually, like when I'm under stress, I try and keep busy. Mm. Hamster on the wheel. 
just just do what I do, just work really hard, just work really hard because it leaves very little like space in your mind to think about yeah. other things. It was like, right, just crack on. Like, li- And my dad, he passed away in Nigeria, so it was like a funeral on Zoom. Oh, shit. I'm sat there in my dressing room, you can see Pink Panther out there in the back and I'm like that, trying to focus. Just like that. <laughs> and then bang. Right, okay, cool, makeup. And I'm just like, yep, yep. And then you crack on. And, you know, it's just one of those things. But how do you deal with grief? How do I deal with grief? That's a big big one. That is a big one. I don't think very well, actually, to to answer it. I I don't think very well at all. Um, I'm not like, I'm not a, it's weird because I'm a massive advocate for like um, mental health and, Speak um, about things and opening up and yeah, hundred percent. Was it was it last year or twenty nineteen? Seventy five percent of all suicides in this country are by men. Mm. Yeah. It's mad. It's so disproportionate, and I don't know um, the stigma around it's been eroded. And but trying to encourage people to speak, and I talk about it because I want to influence more people to not get to that point. Absolutely, and. But then it's something which I try and practice myself, but I'm still not very good yeah, at it. Yeah, I know. I'm getting better. Dude, it's the hardest thing. Well, we were talking about this the other day. What's so easy is that we say as individuals, right, we've got to get over the stigma. What's very hard is to, to allow ourselves to do it. It's very easy to say, okay, you're mm. that person. Come on, talk about it. But then when it comes to us as individuals, we can't do it still. 100%. Imagine, like, I don't know, I see on social media a lot whereby people are like, can you recommend a gardener, a this, a that, or that? Imagine if a bloke just put on Twitter, um, can anyone recommend a good therapist? Mm. I mm. wonder how that would be received. Mm. But, yeah, but, so right. But You're why? so right. Because if I responded and went, oh, this is a therapist I've been chatting to, I'm also admitting that I've struggled and therefore mm. I'm weak and all the rest of it. Yeah. But actually, that could be really, really helpful. That could be the best recommendation you give to someone I know, totally. who just wants to speak. But it's funny how certain things you can talk about openly and other things people don't want to, but... You know, I, I need to be part of the solution in terms of speaking openly. And, and, and I, do, I do as much as I can, but it is a skill. It's a tricky and it thing. is a skill that I need to get lots better at. Do you know the, the funny thing as well, buddy, is that you're, you're obviously one of the captains on Question of Sport. <laughs> I came and did oh, it. Oh, yes. Do you that, know, that do, went, did that I tell you, did well. I tell you the, the, the title that came out? What was the title? Uh, so here we go. The title that came did out. Did we win? Yeah, we bloody won. How do you not remember that? The nation loves Jamie Lyon. The, the, the title that came out afterwards, as I did Question of Sport, um, was Question of Sport slammed after nobody made in Chelsea star Jamie Lang joined panel. Do you, know, do you know what's so frustrating about it is that... <laughs> what? I don't what? know, like... Well, like everything, things change. <laughs> yeah, of course. Things change. And it's a good thing that things change. 100%. And people will say, well, Paddy, actually, I'm not even going to mention that, but people will critique and say lots of different things about um, the captains as well as the presenter. Fine, whatever. But I don't understand why you have to be an ex or current professional sports person to go on to a professional show. Damn straight. Sport is there for everyone. Absolutely everyone. And so by that same metric, if you've never played the game to professional level, why should you be allowed an opinion about the sport then? You've never played it by your own measurements. <laughs> yeah. Because you have to be a professional to be on this show. And sport should appeal to more than just people who have played it at an elite level. Because there's so many fans of the game, of any game, that haven't played it, who have a genuine enthusiasm and probably be able to articulate themselves better than people who've even been involved in it. So I want to be able to get sport out there and for it to stretch as far and wide as it can. And there'll be people who are fans of you that may not realise you're a massive Chelsea fan and that you were excellent javelin thrower <laughs> and cricket ball thrower. No, 52 no, no every, everyone knows about that. Everyone knows about that. tells everyone and every that, day. if that gets people into the sport, brilliant. We had Anton Dubeck on the show. And people yeah. are like, why Anton? <laughs> yeah. He is probably the single best contestant we've ever had. Yeah, he's amazing. His sporting mm. knowledge yeah. was obscene. There was one question. Who was the first person to throw a nine-dart finish? Um, on live TV. Phil Taylor. No. Who was it? I don't know. <laughs> oh Did he know? He knew. <laughs> Did he not remember it? Because <laughs> it was so niche. Was yeah. so, honestly, but I was just like, I wouldn't have a clue. I mean, I, I literally wouldn't have. We could get on 
Um, we could get on, uh, I, I don't know, we could get on so many different people, but I want to be able to export sport to more than just yeah. this kind of, and I'll tell you what, for whatever people say, our viewing figures are doing really well. Yeah, you guys are really, kidding. Really, no, really you're well, great. Right? Also, who's slamming it? Do you know what I mean? Well, no, I it's, I know. It's, it's, it sounds it's, like it's just No, I find it hilarious. Like, but, but listen, um, I the think... Cesspit, which is Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Dude, I just want to say, um, because you're my buddy, you just, super proud of you, man. You're just killing it. Thank you. Yeah, and, and just, also just... Don't want to say it, but one of the funniest and nicest guys I know. <laughs> there you go, said you it. You don't want to say it. Said it. You just said I it. Said it. All right, I said it. I said it. It's been fun. No, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Don't worry, mate. No, genuine. It's it's cool. You and enjoyed it? Um, you put up a post about Candy Kittens the other week. You're yeah. the fastest growing confectionery company in the UK. There you are. There you go. Props to you. Yeah. Right. So there we go. We're just sitting around, just complimenting each other now. Right. That's about it. I should probably wrap it up now, shouldn't we? Yeah. Let's wrap it up. All right. So, well. <sighs> What we, is, that, uh, is this how you because no, this is quite a professional setup that was so not professional <laughs> yeah it was fucking awful but I quite liked okay. it I've enjoyed this you've killed it <laughs> I had a great time I had a I had a great time I had a great time what we do like to do at the end of the podcast oh, okay. here, we go. Go. Here, we go. here we go is leave our listeners with something inspirational <laughs> That's how is we started that, is that it? it. That's how we yeah. started the podcast. Oh, gosh. It was something inspirational. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. What do you mean, oh, my gosh? Come on. I mean, that's... You're in the changing room. The lads are... You're... The lads are 50... Okay, you're in the changing room. Your toes hanging. The lads, the lads are... The lads are... You're, you're, <laughs> you've you're, got you're, no toes left. You, you've, you've, got, you... you've got a whole next half to go. It's the World Cup final. You're 15 points down. You're captain. That's 2019. Okay, okay. You have to... You have we to, lost. You have to rally the troops to bring them back. Can I tell you? We all turn to you. Yeah, you turn There's to a funny story actually, because I think it's 2007, um, World Cup in France, England playing against Africa, and there's a famous, I don't know, some, well, whenever you say there's this famous person, I, I'm not sure whether you should ever say that because people be like, who is that person? <laughs> yeah, I know who is the person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there's a rugby player called Mark Regan, Bristolian, very funny, and everyone's got a million stories on him. But he was trying to rally the troops in the way in which you're talking about right now. They're down against South Africa. Mm. He then went on to win the World Cup and he's in a huddle. He's like, lads, the first half has been crap and blah, 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 blah. We need to rise from the flames like a pheasant. <laughs> <laughs> And that's when they knew they'd lost. This is World Cup. And so sho shoulders are shrugging like this, okay? <laughs> And people like catching one another's eyes and it's like, I don't know. I'm not sure this is the time to have a gag, but he's been deadly serious and he's still going on. <laughs> anyway, and the lads are like, cheers then, let's go out second half. The boy's chatting to him and he's like, mate, do you know it's rise from the flames like a phoenix? He went, oh, I knew it was a bird starting with an F. <laughs> Perfect, let's play. <laughs> <laughs> you can, okay. Thank you so much. We're going to see you next week, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>